See the ones that were missed the most? Yes, from the practice test. Sketch uh, the graph of each line. What form is that line in? It is in standard form. And what was the most convenient way I taught you to graph in standard form way back in the day? Well, no, you, you could solve for y, and that's probably the way that most teachers teach you to do it, is to convert it into slope-intercept, but I showed you a shortcut. That, that would help you with a slope, but again, that's not what I showed you. I should, with standard form, there's kind of a more direct way to graph it that not everybody teaches, but I tried to show you to help you. Too, too long ago? Well, close. It, it, it was to graph the intercepts. To find the intercepts. So the x intercept, which is going to tell you where you cross the x axis, and the y intercept, which is where you cross the y. The, um, if, if a is in front here, then b is negative 3, and c is 9, the x intercept is going to be c over a. So this is going to cross the x at 9 over 1, which is at 9. And then the um, y intercept is going to be c over b. This is going to cross the y-axis at 9 over negative 3, which is negative 3. And then all you got to do is see which one of these lines is crossing the x at 9 and the y at negative 3. Now, it looks like none of these windows are big enough for us to be able to see it crossing at 9. But we could kind of tell if it's see like, uh, that definitely it can't be A. Because A is not going towards 9 on the x-axis, so it can't be A. B looks like it might. It definitely is crossing at negative 3. And it looks like it's headed towards 9. So D is definitely a possibility. we got to see um, if there's any other one that's close or not. Definitely can't be C. Because C is you know, 9 on the x-axis somewhere over here. That's not even close. And it looks like D is 9. So the only one that it could be. What form is this in? Slope intercept. Now, these are the ones that we're missing the most. And so all you have to do here is find something that has a slope of negative 1 over 5 and a y intercept of 0, 2. Negative slopes go up and to the left and down and to the right. So that already eliminates uh, C and it can't be C. I'd probably go to the y intercept next, crossing at 0, 2. A is definitely crossing at 0, 2, so that's fine. B is not crossing at 0, 2. And neither is D. So the only one really that it could be is A. But if you wanted to see the slope, a slope of negative over, uh, 1 over 5 goes 1 up. They're counting by 2 here. But it goes 1 up and then 5, either 1 up and then 5 to the left or 1 um, down and 5 to the right. Rise over line. Solve each equation. What would I do first here? I distribute 8r minus 37 is equal to negative 15 plus 30r. Let's put all the r's on the same side now. What would be the best way to put all the r's on the same side? Okay. Yeah. Let's make minus 8r. Move all the r's to the right. Now, what do I have to do to balance that out? Very good here. Take that, Ferris. Uh, so that's what negative 22 is equal to 22r divided by 22. Negative 1 is equal to r. What would you have typed into the Google form? One. Negative 1. If you're still planning on doing the homework for this week that's on the Google form, same thing. Just put the negative 1. What's wrong, Ferris? Are you going to fight crime after class? Are you planning on fighting crime? Can you take the hoodie off, please? Okay, uh, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure if we did these or not. I feel like we did. Um, yeah, we did. Well, okay, no, actually, no, I, I take it back. Well, I know I know we didn't do these um, during the regular, but we did these the other day. Where it was... Uh, 
Like yeah, climbing up the hill. Now look, something is different here from the one that we did in class the other day. Look at the signs. They're both missing the little or equal to underneath. So when you draw them, the lines, they're not going to be solid. They're going to be like that. Yeah. So um, now the nice thing is that both of these are in slope intercept. So the slope here it is uh, 6 over 1, and the y-intercept is 0, negative 3. The slope here is 1 over 1, and the y-intercept is 0, 2. So let's look for two lines that are dashed. One of them is crossing at 0, 2 with um, going up one, right one. And the other one is crossing at 0, negative 3, going up, up 6, and right 1. So it looks like A is a possibility. Uh, it looks like B cannot be because uh, you have a solid line. The slopes are all off. can't be that one. It looks like C is a possibility because it's crossing at 2 and going up 1, right 1, and also crossing at um, what the negative 3 yeah, and going up 6. So C is a possibility. Uh, and B is it. So we're between C, C and A look identical the only difference being where the shade is. Does anybody happen to remember the word that I used to describe where the shade on these? There was one word I used to describe. The lines on the lines. No, no, but that's individually. I'm just talking about at the end, at the end, the final product, what you're going to end up shading. It starts with over and ends with lap. The overlap. Remember, I showed you with the primary colors that would overlap and make a secondary color. Mm -hmm. So yeah, now individually, what Ferris was saying is correct. Look, the mouth is not eating a Y on, on this one that's crossing at negative three. The mouth is not eating a Y, so you're supposed to shave down where the brown would be. So like, if I were to bring back my um, highlighter, if I if I were to just shade that one, it would be here. But then on, on the other one, the one crossing at 2, there I am eating the Y, so I would want to shade the sky there. So if I shade the sky, what ends An up? Error has occurred. I'm unable to answer your question. Try what? again later. What ends up magically uh, turning green? What ends up magically turning green? Yeah, the, well, the overlap, sure, but the overlap is just a little sliver on the top. So the answer then is not going to be A. It's going to be the one that has that little sliver shaded. You may or may not get these. I, I, I think you'd be more likely to get the individual ones, the ones that it's just one inequality at a time. So far, so far. No. False. 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 All right, here we go. Uh, solve by substitution. Um, I don't necessarily think substitution will be the best way to go here. So I, you, you want to do you want to do it differently? You want to do elimination? All right. So let's do elimination. What variable would you prefer to eliminate? Uh, X. Yeah, that's the only one I would really do elimination with is the X because the signs are already different, and if I just multiply the top by eight, we'll be all set to go. So 8x minus 24y is equal to negative 24. The bottom equation stays the same. When you eliminate, what are you really doing? You'll get it. That's so far away. Okay, the x's cancel out, and I get the negative 19y is equal to negative 38 divided by negative 19. So y is 2. Now we can get that y and plug it into whatever equation you want. Let's just assume you pick the top one. So x minus 3 times 2 is equal to negative 3. x minus 6 is equal to negative 3 plus 6. x is 3. So what's the answer there? Um, eight. Huh?
Okay. You writing all this down, Jake? The school that Kayla goes to is selling tickets to a choral performance on the first. I skipped the question? Yeah. Let's say Yes, no. Well, you have it in a different order on your paper? Yeah. I, will, I don't care. I'm going to this one. Take that first. So the school that Kayla goes to is selling tickets to a choral performance on the first day of ticket sales. The school sold two adult tickets and 10 child tickets for a total of $56. The school took in 200 on the second day by selling 14 adult tickets and six child tickets. What is the price of one adult ticket and one child ticket? So the first thing you want to do is actually look at the question. Because the question is going to tie into the very, uh, to your variables, to your unknowns. That's what we're looking for. You look for a variable. You look to answer a question. What's the price of an adult ticket and a child ticket? So let's let A be the cost of an adult ticket. And let's let C be the cost of a child ticket. But since we have two unknowns, that means we need two equations. Can you come up with two equations based on the information you were provided? I know Skylar can. Look at, the, look at the second sentence. Okay, 2A is good. Yeah, that's a good start. 2A plus 10C is equal to 56. That'll work. And then on the second one, they made $200 by selling 14 adults tickets and 6 And now this just becomes a system. I only had one person all day that asked me this question. I, and I'm, I would hope it's because other people just know how to use their computers, but I'm guessing it's not. It's just because we didn't get the right answer. But there, there were several answers here. And in order to be able to get to, I believe, the adult one, you had to scroll it to the to the right. But on the Chromebook, sometimes that little scroll bar doesn't show up. So you had to like kind of like ho hover the mouse over so that the scroll bar would show up. You'll see what I mean now. Uh, what method do you want to use? Um, yeah, I definitely would use elimination. And I'd probably just get rid of the A's by multiplying the top by negative 7. So now when I rewrite it, I get negative 14A minus 7DC. Oh, negative 392. If you have a calculator handy, check my math. Jane, are you still my calculator person? So the A's cancel, and that gives me um, negative 64C is equal to negative 192. Divide by negative 64. And the child ticket costs $3. Once you know the cost of the child ticket, now you can plug into any equation to find the adult ticket. I'll just use the top one. So two adult tickets plus 10 child tickets that I know cost $3 now is equal to 56. So uh, 2A plus 30 is equal to 56 minus 30. 26 divided by 2 is 13. And that's what I was talking about. If on that first screen, the 13 didn't show up, so you had to like scroll to the right for to, to be able to see the 13. But I only had one person ask me that the whole day. Any questions there? What? I don't need to check it anymore. I got it though, so thank you. Identify the slope of the graph uh, of the function from negative 2 to 1. Well, these are intervals, which we did recently. Okay, we're like, okay, they're giving us the x's, negative 2, 
and one. The thing is that this is a line. The slope is going to be the same no matter what two points you pick. I'll go ahead and pick the points that they asked me to, but you don't have to. Not on a line. I could pick any two points here, and the slope the slope is going to be the same. The only time the slope changes is if the graph starts curving and changing direction. So at negative 2, let's see, at negative 2, no, it doesn't look like 6, it looks like 7. And then at 1, it looks like 1. So slope would be 7 minus 1 over negative 2 minus 1, which is 6 over negative 3, which is negative 2. And if you look at the slope anywhere, since this is a line, what that should mean is I should be able to look at this anywhere. And that's from the beginning, I should have a rise of 2, a run of 1, rise of 2, uh, run of negative 1. Up 2, left 1, up 2, left 1, up 2, left 1, and that appears to be the case. Throughout, this is rising 2 and running negative 1. Or you can say it's rising, it's going down 2 and to the right 1, down 2, right 1, down 2, right 1. We have a shot. Any questions for me? Any questions for Ferris? No. Find the GCF of the expression. So here all they're asking for, asking for is the greatest common factor. What's the biggest number I can divide all of those by? What's the biggest number I can divide all three of those terms by? By two. But then you also have to ask yourself, do they have a variable in common? No. So we're done. That's it. Boom goes the dynamite. That's it. The, the greatest common factor is 2. If you were to factor, they're not asking to factor, but if you were to factor, then you have to leave, okay, 2x squared minus 3x plus 5, and then see if that can be factored any further, which it looks like it can. But that's not what they were asking us. They were only being asked for a common factor, which is 2. Right, Skyler von Hirschsprung. What are the zeros of a function? Okay, we might have talked about this a little bit, well, especially in this last unit with uh, functions. Then anybody know what zeros of a function are? When they're asking you for zeros of a function? You, you, you see this again, if and when you do make it to the second semester of Algebra 1, this is what you start with. Well, it's, well that's, that's actually pretty good. It, it is when the y's are zero, but an easier way of saying it is the x-intercepts. It's just a fancy way of asking you where it's crossing the x-axis. Zeros can also be, sometimes you might see the word roots. And if you don't see it on the test on Friday, you'll see it next semester if, the, if you go on to second semester. So zeros, roots, x-intercepts, they all mean the same thing. So where is it crossing the x-axis? Uh, two, uh, two, uh, well, yeah, two comma zero. I think for, I don't I don't remember if I had them. Did I have them as points as uh, for the choices? Because it's this, or was it just a number? Uh huh. Correct. Uh -huh, but uh -huh, but next next to the check spot, was it an ordered pair like this? It was just a number, right? So it would have been. So you would have just checked the box that was next to a two, and then um. Check the bar if it's next to six. But but you are correct though. If, uh, if it was in the form of an ordered pair, it would be two comma zero and six comma zero. Depends on how they choose to write it. Uh, solve the following equation. Okay, this one should be pretty simple. First step. First step. Distributive property. Negative 2a minus 2 minus 6. Then we combine like terms that we put in the line. What would be the best way to put all the variables on the same oops? All the variables on the same side. Uh add both sides like this. Okay, I would add 2a to both sides like that. And then to the balance that off minus 6. So now all the variables are on the left and all the constants are on the right. Jojo, you okay? Is that best? 
Oh, and if you look on the E-Class page, the same thing that I'm not sure if you guys actually look at, uh, I, I posted the percent that you got on this practice test and the curve next to it. So. The ratio of giraffes to tigers in a zoo is five to four. There are eight tigers in the zoo. How many giraffes are there? What's a ratio? Oh. Close. The word ratio in one word. What is the closest math word to a ratio? It's a fancy word for what? Who said it? Yeah, it's a fraction. So that 5 with a colon 4, that's the same thing as saying 5 over 4, okay? Um, what we're trying to do here is set up a, um, a proportion. So if they give you this ratio, you would put an equal sign. And then the thing is, we got to figure out that 8, do you put it on the top or the bottom? But the 8 are tigers. Okay, the 8 are tigers. So if the ratio was giraffes to tigers... That means that the five was for giraffes and the four was for tigers. It's kind of like analogies. Have you done analogies in English class? When they say like cat is to meow as dog is to bark. You've never done analogies? You'll do that before you take the SAT. So if the five corresponds to giraffes and the four to tigers, and then they say eight tigers, is the eight going to go on the top or on the bottom? Yeah, the bottom, because that's where the tiger is going, on the bottom. And then we'll just use whatever variable we want. I use G for giraffes. How do you solve a proportion? Cross both. Crisscross cross applesauce. So 4G is 40. And there are 10 giraffes. Have you ever seen a giraffe? Have you ever fed a giraffe? You should. Wrong to zoo? Yeah. Have you ever seen penguins? They have penguins too at the zoo. No caps. There's also penguins in the equator. Look it up. Equator penguins are the best types of penguins. Solve this equation with a quadratic formula. Yeah, you can definitely use quadratic formula if you want, but I wouldn't here. With, uh, with A being 1, B being negative 6, and C being 5. Um, I would just do factoring. Can you think of two? Anytime A is 1, I always try it. See, the thing is factoring won't always work. But I'll try it. Yeah. Can we do that like... Yeah, that, 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 that is the quadratic formula. Yeah, yeah, and uh, okay, fine. The, the nice thing about quadratic formula is that it is on a reference sheet. So if you, if you feel comfortable with it, you can use it. I just think it takes a long time if you don't have to. Can you think in your head of two numbers that multiply to give you five and add it to negative six? Or well, close. One plus five is not negative six. Negative 1 and negative 5. If you're not bad with your times tables and you want to do that, x minus 1, x minus 5. Negative 1 times negative 5 is positive 5. Check. And when you add them, it gives you negative 6. So then I can now just make each one equal to 0, which means that x equals 1 and x equals 5. That's the way out. Do you want me to do it? With, uh, I'll do it. I'll have time. I'll do it with quadratic formula. Too. You're good? Yeah. What is the range of a function? Okay, well, the key here is just knowing what this would look like. What type of function is that? Uh, of a what? Like, what would it look like? Now, 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 what form is it in? 
I don't know what it looked like. And I put that on the ground for what it looked like. What did it look like physically? What did it look like? What, what, what would I be looking at a picture of if I put it on a line? But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I put it on. It, it'd be a line. And this is a line. Lines are not the only type of graphs you study. We've all studied parabolas and you know, all these other types of fun pursuits. This is a line. And specifically, uh, it's a line with a positive slope, but it's a line. And if range is how far up and how far down, how far does a line go up? Infinity, how far does the line go down? Infinity. So in um, in interval notation, this would be the negative infinity, positive infinity. I think for this test, I probably put all real numbers. Which means the same thing. All real numbers. Which of the following quadratic function has a minimum or maximum? So it could be either one. What's another word for minimum or maximum? A vertex. a vertex. So, and these are all in vertex form. Which one of these has a vertex of negative five and seven? Yeah, it is B. Because remember, for the H, you got to change the sign. Now, if there was a follow-up question that would ask you, okay, well, now that we know B is the answer, is it a minimum or a maximum there? Minimum. Good. This is an upwards-facing parabola because A is positive. Therefore, the vertex is at the bottom. Skyler knows that. So he's just going to set this one out. <clears throat> a table defines a quadratic function. All right, so see, this is like average rate of change, like we just did with the line. But now because this is quadratic, I have to use those points. Negative 1 comma something and 1 comma something. But the nice thing, this is a table. What y is going to go with negative 1? For the x, 5. What well, y is going to go with 1? Yeah, so we just did these. Uh, slope is 5 plus 1 over negative 1 minus 1, which is 6 over negative 2, which is negative 3. Negative 3. Jojo, are you scared of the monsters? They're going to come and get you. Diana will protect you. Oh, second time today we see this. Zeros of a function. Last time it was nice because we could see a graph, but what does zeros of a function mean? Okay, an easy x intercept. If I was looking at a graph, that would be easy. X intercepts. Uh, but actually, what would help me here is something else Ferris happened to stumble upon. Um, since we can't see the graph, what do we? What are the zeros of a function mean? It means to get the zeros and put them. We can see the f for function. Put them where the y is. So this is just a quadratic equation. This can be solved by factoring, but shout out to my homie Ferris. I'm going to do this quadratic formula just for him. Hash brown TBW. Um, X is equal to, if B is 23, what's negative B? Negative 23 plus or minus the square root of 23 squared. Jay, get ready with that calculator. Minus 4 times 1 times 60 over uh, 2 times 1. X is equal to negative 23 plus or minus the square root of 23 squared. Is it like 469 or something like that? 23 times 23. 529. 529. And then 1 negative, so it stays negative. 4 times 1 times 60 is 240 over 2. And there we go, negative 23 plus or minus the square root of 289. 289. And then check the square root of, I think, I think that's 17. Check what's the square root of 289? Cool. 
What are we doing when we get to the plus or minus? Split it good. X is equal to negative 23 plus 17 over 2. X is equal to negative 23 minus 17 over 2. So X is equal to negative 6 over 2, which is negative 3. X is equal to negative 4 over 2, which is negative 20. has negative 20 and negative 3. And then finally, the last one, last but not least, the graph below tracks gasoline prices from July to December. What is the slope of the line from November to December? So what is the slope of this line here? Okay. Well, but Mr. Romero, there's no numbers on the bottom. Okay, what are some numbers that we can put in for months, especially for November and December? What month of the year is November? Yeah, that's what I would do. I'll put a number for November. And then what's the price in uh, November? $1.40. What month is December? The 12th month of the year. And then the price there appears, and there's no way to be sure, but it looks like it's 139. That's the best guess we can take, $1.39. So what is the slope of that line from November to December? 140 minus 139 over 11 minus 12 is 0 0.01 to the negative one, which is negative 10. So the price went down by a penny. Joseph thought that way. All right, so I am done. I will not see you tomorrow. Remember, you go to seventh period. And then Friday we test.